well students today we are to study longinus's theory on the subline longinus comes third in our uh, course first we studied plato and then aristotle and now we have longinus you know longinus starts from where plato leaves plato said that all poets they are inspired by the muse they are possessed they are divinely possessed they write out of imagination and they represent falsehood they misrepresent gods the faculty of imagination which is quite intense which is quite high in the poets was not entertained was not approved by plato and this becomes the very starting point for longinus this was also the starting point for aristotle because aristotle also offended his teacher plato by saying that when poets imitate an idea a painting they are then they are not merely copy it is not a blind imitation that's what aristotle said because they add the colors of imagination emotion their own perception and hence they provide something new longinus said no matter whether poets imitate the idea or not the primary aim of every literature is to instruct to delight and then he added one more feather which feather he added that we'll see but first let us try to locate longinus's time period as in all our lectures here also we shall follow the ppt he belonged to the 3rd century bc and he was a greek or roman critic r s scott james calls him the first romantic critic now why he is known as the first romantic critic here the term romantic is not in the sense of literary period in the sense of romantic age but we know romantic as that which is something new so when longinus came with his great critical treatises it was entirely a new concept of aesthetic appreciation that he was giving to literature unlike plato he did not talk about art being imitative and hence representing falsehood aristotle of course he also appreciated art he also appreciated the domain of literature but then his domain was limited his emphasis is more on tragedy no doubt he brings into some discussion the comedy form as well in his critical treatises the poetics and somewhere loosely he also talks about epic and other lyric poetry but his major concern is with the tragedy form why because in his times only tragedy and comedy this two drama forms prevailed in greece so his his field is narrow 
But when Longinus comes, he's not talking about a particular genre. As Aristotle asked the ontological question, what is tragedy? What is tragic hero? He's not asking who is tragic hero. He's asking what is tragic hero, isn't it? All noble and dignified having one minor fold in him. He asks what is catharsis? So Aristotle's question, Aristotle's theory is based on ontological question. And Longinus actually goes into the aesthetics of literature or any literary form you can see. It is in this sense that Longinus is known to be, is considered as the first romantic critic. Let us go further now. And he is the pioneer in the field of aesthetic appreciation of literature. How he is the pioneer in the field of aesthetic appreciation that I explained to you just now. That he doesn't talk about uh, how something is uh, written and whether it is true or false. Whether it presents the truth or falsehood. And he doesn't... Uh, uh, remain limited to only a particular genre but his his uh, uh, perception of uh, literature his sense of appreciation of literature is quite comprehensive and it is in this sense that he is the pioneer in the field of aesthetic, aesthetic appreciation of literature on the subline uh, it is the title of his critical treatise. On the sublime is a combination of classicism and romanticism. Uh, as we proceed into our discussion, we'll see that he talks about five sources of the sublime. And therein he gives emphasis to noble diction. Now, you know, dignified diction, noble diction is a feature of classicism as well and romanticism use of certain figures of speech noble thought so on and so forth these are the few elements of romanticism so it combines the two basically it is written in an epistolary form epistolary is something which was written in the form of letters with the medium of letters so on the sublime is written in an epistolary form and it is believed to be addressed to Posthumus Terentianus, uh, Longinus's friend or pupil. Uh, as I said in the beginning that there are mainly two ends, two aims of literature. <clears throat> literature is primarily meant to delight first and then instruct. Literature does not always aim at giving instruction. It, it, it is either a secondary aim or you can say it is the byproduct of literature. We have only one genre, one subtype in comedy, for example, comedy of manners or satirical comedies of Ben Jonson, which were also known as corrective comedies. They strictly aimed at correcting whatever the weaknesses of the society. But all other genres of literature, if you see, all other types of comedies, if you see, then writers did not write with a strict aim of teaching something to society. Their aim was to give pleasure, to relieve society from their daily stress and strain, to entertain them. So that is why here Longinus observes that mainly there are two ends, two aims of literature. One is to instruct, the other is to delight. And then when he comes with his theory, he adds one more and that is to transport. What is to transport? Let us 
read here. Longine is added to transport. That is, nothing is poetry unless it transports. Now, transport means to take you above the mundane world. To take the reader beyond this world of realities, struggles, problems. Something that takes you to say cloud nine, that gives you the feeling of cloud nine, takes you to the seventh heaven. Something utmost joyous, that is the feeling of transport. So it is not a mere child's joy. You know, a child when looks at the running deer, then is surprised, giggles. It is not mere that joy, temporary, transient, short-lived joy that Longinus is talking about. But it is a permanent blissful state that he means when he says that literature also aims to transport. Okay, let us go further in the discussion. Now, let us check the characteristics of sublime. Uh, sub, by sublimity, longinus means elevation or loftiness. It is a certain distinction and excellence in composition. You know, entire poetic composition, entire literary composition has to have the mark of excellence. It has to be distinct from other common literary works. Now, how to fix this mark of excellence? Which are the factors that would make the work excellent, which would give them a distinctive quality? This Longinus talks about at length. First, let us check the characteristics. The very first and very primary characteristic is it pleases. A work of literature which provides pleasure. Then it pleases immediately. It, it, is, it is not that today you read a literary work and then you take time to understand. One has to uh, understand the allusions. One has to understand the reference and co-reference. It is not like that. It is a simple work of literature. It is a simple composition. And it is the simplicity that pleases. And yet it is sublime. Then it pleases all immediately. You see, in all the characteristic, pleasing remains common. Providing pleasure remains common. Then it should provide pleasure immediately. Then it should provide pleasure to all. Irrespective of country, culture, language, age, it should provide pleasure to children and old alike. Wordsworth's poetry, for example, they are enjoyed by even children and even elderly people. So uh, it is in this sense that uh, we have to understand it pleases all immediately. Then it pleases all immediately and forever. Not that today you have read and today one is amused, one is entertained. But even after years when one reads the same work of literature, one is able to derive the same intensity of pleasure. Shakespeare's comedies are enjoyable even now. And that quality of joy, that intensity of joy is still the same as it was read for the first time years back. Same goes with Wordsworth's poetry. Same goes with Shelley's poems, so on and so forth. And then it is, it pleases all immediately at all the places and forever. Literature is not nation bound, though it may be written in a particular nation, but it should have universal appeal. So not that whatever is written by the Indian writers is not appreciated by the British writers or vice versa. 
W.B. Yeats, an Irish poet, wrote an introduction or a preface to Tagore's Gitanjali. Now, this is the mark of the sublimity of Tagore's poems, you know. It pleases all at all places, immediately and forever. So, this uh, characteristics of sublime must be clear to you now. Then, true sublime. Now, how do we come to know that this is a sublime work? Then, you know, there are certain, of course, this characteristic marks by which one can make out whether sublime is, it, it, whether the work is really sublime or not. Another is, if the work is truly sublime, then it uplifts the soul. I already talked about cloud nine feeling or seventh heaven feeling. It arises from lofty ideas clothed in lofty language. Now, you know, here we get two conditions to make the work sublime. One is lofty ideas. Noble ideas should be presented. Something which would make the society better, make the human beings nobler. And these noble ideas should be presented in lofty language, dignified, ornamental language. And false sublime is merely a gorgeous exterior. It is bombastic language and cheap passion. So that also can be considered as faults of sublime. That when one tries to present noble ideas in noble language, then there are also chances of uh, leaning to bombastic purility and frigidity in language. So the, the poet, the author ha has to be extra careful when appointing the medium called language so that it doesn't move towards uh, bombastic uh, artificiality, you can say. Now we talk about the sources of sublime. Uh, mainly the sources can be divided into two heads and they are inborn sources and acquired skills. So within inborn, again, we have two, grandeur of thought and capacity for strong emotion. You know, thought is always inherent, inborn. Thought cannot be acquired from outside. It comes from within. Secondly, it is capacity for strong emotions. Emotions cannot be hired. It is one's heart, heart's genuine, intense feeling that is uh, uh, responsible for the expression of a thought or a feeling. So, uh, grandeur of thought and capacity for strong emotions. These are the two sources which we can say they are inborn. And skills, then appropriate use of figures of speech. This is a technical aspect now. So, that can always be learned and acquired. So, <clears throat> appropriate use of figures of speech, then nobility of diction, choice of words. Diction is a choice of words. So, which kinds of words should be chosen for which kind of theme, for which type of character, all these things. That also can be learned. Then, dignified and elaborated composition. So, these three, we can say they are purely the technical uh, aspects. Which, which require an effort, a practice. So in all, there are five sources of the sublime. Grandeur of thought, capacity for strong emotions, appropriate use of figures of speech, nobility of diction, and the last is dignified, elaborated composition. Let us now take every source individually in detail. We first take Granger of Thought. Longinus calls it the first essential element because it is the thought that makes the work. You know, even uh, uh, Plato also called plot is the soul of treasury. Plato also considered Plato, uh, plot as the essential thing. So what is plot? It is nothing but the very subject matter, the very storyline. 
Longinus also, um, we can draw a parallel here because uh, Longinus just uses the word thought and not because Aristotle is talking about the drama form, he says plot. But mainly he means the very subject matter or the story part. And to write a story, it is first the idea or the thought. So uh, Longinus also gives the first importance to uh, grandeur of thought and not ordinary thought he means. He has very clearly written that it, it, it should be a grand thought. Only such thoughts would have the universal appeal. Just before some time I talked about what universal appeal is while we were discussing the characteristics. So uh, lofty thoughts find expression in lofty language. Now, nobler the idea, better should be the language. The grand the idea, the ornamental, equally ornamental language should be employed to convey that grand idea. Otherwise, the idea would not have any importance. So, uh, Paradise Lost, for example, Milton's Paradise Lost, there the grand thought is, you know, the, the very aim of Paradise Lost. John Milton, in the very beginning of the epic, states its purpose that it is to justify the ways of God to men. We know the story of Paradise Lost that uh, Eve was uh, tempted by a serpent disguised and uh, she ate first the forbidden fruit and then she drew she tempted Adam also to eat the same forbidden fruit and they were punished and they were thrown down to the earth. And Satan and other evil angels were also, as a part of punishment, were thrown down to the hell. Now from the hell, Satan and his troop, they planned to take revenge against God because they were unduly punished, according to them. So uh, it is, uh, you know, the evil that plans to take revenge of God. So Milton had to state that Paradise Lost is written with the aim of justifying the ways of God to men. So if one disobeys God, what happens? What punishment one undergoes? And then uh, what are the steps to regain the paradise, right? So this is a grand thought and how ornamental, how dignified language, uh, how embellished language Milton uses in his Paradise Lost. So, you know, there should be a, a fine, harmonious mingling of grand thought and grand language. Lofty thought, lofty language. Hmm? Stay, uh, lofty thoughts, they are the echo of the greatness of soul. Milton is not talking anything trivial, anything insignificant. He is not interested in talking about only the Satans, only the evils, but he is also talking about the compassion of Christ and how he would be beneficial to the mankind how he would redempt mankind, right? So these are the noble thoughts. So uh, lofty thoughts are always an echo of the greatness of soul. So that's why we, we con have considered the grandeur of thought as the inborn uh, source because it is one's within, one's conscience, one's higher state of mind. That determines the quality of thought. Stately thought belongs to lofty mind, acquired by thinking noble and imitating great masters. If one thinks big, if one mind 
functions in a healthy way to, to think something good something noble then only such thoughts would be presented through literature or one can even imitate the ideas of the great masters of ancient literature so that is all about grandeur of thought we then move to the second source and that is capacity for strong emotion so uh, that is true emotion in right place you know every emotion should be employed at its due place otherwise it looks like a vulgarity otherwise it looks like the presentation of cheap passions an artist's function is to arouse emotional transport it is the main duty of the artist to arouse the same emotions that writer himself or herself felt at the time of writing and the reader also feeling the same emotion with the same intensity at the time of reading so uh, that is what uh, uh, i think many of the good english poets are able to do um, whether you read uh, uh, some of wordsworth's poems if you read wordsworth uh, say um, rainbow my heart leaps up when i see rainbow in the sky or if you read his solitary reaper then you know that melancholic song that he uh, hears when he passes by melancholic song sung by a Uh, young girl while she is reaping in the farm and what kind of feeling wordsworth has and the same he is able to transmute in us arouse in us so you know that is the function of the poets so um artist's function is to arouse emotional transport artist himself must be charged with deep emotions to arouse the same in the readers you know if you try to recollect the description of daffodils the 10000 so i at a glance and uh, they were spread like a milky way so you know we also visualize the same thing we also feel the thrill we also feel this the joy as if we are looking at the sight of the beautiful daffodils flowers right so um, the emotions that wordsworth felt by recollecting the sight he had once visited then the same he is able to convey to us so that is what uh, is meant by arousing the same emotions poet himself being first charged with the deep emotions and the same he should be able to convey to the readers it is here that longinus proves to be a romantic critic and he challenges plato why he challenges plato because plato strictly objected to the emotional appeal that poetry has isn't it uh, rather he he rejected poetry on the emotional ground uh, but it was uh, uh, longinus who considered emotional appeal as as the something which is uh, noble even aristotle also emphasized on emotional appeal of the literary works calling it necessary catharsis hmm? relieving the stress and strain and here uh, longinus gives entirely different meaning to the emotional appeal and he compares it with sublimity you know it is through high in high or intense emotional feeling that one attains the state of sublimity that is what longinus believes we now move to the next uh, source and that is appropriate use of figures of speech so when we say appropriate use of figures of speech we mean the excellence of style you know once the thought is grand and the the grand thought is presented in a grand language then comes you know the garnishing you can say the coloring uh, making it ornamental embellished technical aspects so uh, that that marks the excellence of style 
Longinus figures judiciously employed play an important part in producing sublimity. Figures of speech judiciously employed, wisely employed. Not that all the figures of speech that the poet knows, poet employs everything. Poet has to be wise. Which object requires a figure of speech? Or which object requires which figure of speech? Not that everything should be presented with the help of simile and metaphor. So which figures of speech should be employed and at which places they should be employed. So the, this requires the technical knowledge. So uh, that is why Longinus has said here that figures of speech judiciously or uh, wisely used. They play an important part in producing sublimity. The figures of speech should be employed at right place, at right occasion, in right manner, and with right motive. Otherwise, now if this third source, appropriate use of figures of speech, if this is not followed well, if this is not practiced well, it can lead to bombast and artificiality which is a fault in the theory of sublime. Um, figures of speech should be used in a natural manner to avoid artificiality. You know, uh, what to include and what to exclude, that the poet should know. And this technique or this knowledge, Longinus calls, art lies in concealing art. Where where the hyperbole is required, where exaggeration is required, and why it is required. Um, so if this distinction, whether to employ the figure of speech or not, if this, this distinction is known well, then the poet is the master, is a real artist. So art lies in concealing art. Uh, he mainly emphasizes on a few figures of speech like the rhetorical question, hyperbeton, hyperbeton is a strange use of words, then apostrophe, repetition, uh, refrain also can be said, etc. And figures add strangeness to everyday speech. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in Indian aesthetics, Kuntak, Poetician. He calls it Vakrokti. Vakrokti is oblique manner of speaking, you know, giving a strangeness, strange quality to the everyday speech. Um, not the colloquial, not even highly embellished, but something of day to day life, but it is uttered in a striking manner, right? So uh, we can draw a parallel here. Uh, for this particular point. It satisfies the basic demand of human nature for a pleasant surprise. You know, when common utterances are given the uh, quality of strangeness, then it automatically leads to the surprising effect. So that is what uh, is about source number three. Moving next, we have nobility of diction. By nobility of diction, we mean choice of words and arrangement of words. Also, it includes use of metaphor and simile. Noble diction depends on high thinking and high feeling. We already discussed this point, point when we were discussing grandeur of thought and um, strong emotions, right? So. Uh, the higher the mind thinks, the nobler the mind thinks, the similar kind of language is required to convey a grand idea. So proper and striking words appeal to the hearers and they have moving effect. You know, apt use of words. One should avoid overstatements. One should use, uh, one should avoid roundabout ways of saying beating about the bush to seed and one word but meaning hundreds that kind of uh, maybe pun right uh, one small word one small sentence but meaning 
deeper. So that kind of uh, diction Longinus refers to. Um, Shakespeare's dramas, for example, have uh, so many such aphorisms, quotable lines, even Milton's Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, uh, Samson Agonists, they have quite uh, quotable lines. So that we can say that is uh, nobility of diction. And now coming to the last source. And that is uh, dignified composition. By dignified composition, Longinus means harmonious arrangement of words and it is the overall harmony, you know, all the four sources preceded. Thought, emotion, figures of speech and diction, all four and finally the entire composition and harmony among all these five uh, sources, they lead to organic unity in art which ultimately appeals to the soul you know no loose ends no loose emotions um, nothing mean nothing trivial nothing insignificant everything grand everything noble simple yet sublime that kind of uh, uh, requirements if they are fulfilled then that is called harmony which provides an organic unity you know it makes a composite artwork uh, and that appeals to the soul of the readers and uh, such a quality enables readers to share the emotions of author or poet so composition should be neither too long nor too short you know quite proportionate quite balanced here we may also recollect the uh, freytex pyramid of dramatic design that uh, uh, everything is uh, uh, finely connected interconnected and coming to logical conclusion that is with reference to drama but the same applies to poetic composition as well appropriate use of figures of speech appropriate use of uh, words um, suitable words for uh, particular kinds of thought which are employed in poetry and this all leading to the organic unity of poetic composition or literary composition and Longinus says the use of simple composition he, he does give emphasis to simple composition the use of simple composition too is helpful in achieving the splendor of style so he doesn't uh, talk about anything complex or compound uh, compositions complex or compound plot hmm? but uh, he, he talks about simple compositions which can also elevate the readers and now to conclude our discussion of uh, today Longinus provides universal outlook for aesthetics. Uh, in the beginning, I said that uh, his perception of aesthetic appreciation is not limited to a particular genre. Uh, his uh, understanding, his uh, sense of appreciation uh, for literature is quite vast, quite universal. And uh, he talks about uh, what can elevate the reader, how can the work be elevating, how can the work be sublime, and how the same sublimity that author felt at the time of composition, the readers can also feel at the time of reading, right? So in this way, he provides universal outlook. Uh, Longinus' theory is free from prejudice. And Atkins rightly says that there are, in short, many respects in which Longinus stands high as a judicial critic. And we have also George Sainsbury who says, 
So then there abide these three, Aristotle, Longinus, and Coleridge, right? So among all the critics who talked about aesthetic appreciation of literature, George Sainsbury uh, keeps the three um, in as, as important critics, and they are Aristotle, Longinus, and Coleridge. So with this, our discussion on Longinus's sublime comes to end.